Welcome to the Hidden Bookcase. Come through and get cozy. Pick a book, your favourite book. That's the one that opens this room. Inside you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a dangerously high to be red pile. I'm Morgan, I use they, them pronouns, and I am two morally grey, hot bisexual women back from the dead. I'm Sorin, I use he, him pronouns, and I am Elo's knife on Aaron's throat. I'm India, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a lock of Inara's hair. Sorin and I have been friends for over a decade, and the two of us are always swapping books. Each fortnight, the two of us, sometimes with help from a friend, take it in turns to recommend one another a favourite read. The first time reader tells us what they know about the book, makes some predictions about what they don't, and then we discuss our thoughts with all of you bookworms. This spring, we're reading sequels. So today, let's get to talking about... Sunbringer by Hannah Kana. We're back. India's back. Back better than ever. Thank you for joining us again. I was just grateful to be invited back. I was like, could have done the first one and never be invited back again. So I'm um, just having a beer. <laughs> so because we have all read God Killer, but none of us had read Sunbringer, we all have predictions. We all have a blind reaction. Yeah, our first guest blind react. A very, very long blind react as well let's listen before we like get into it because i'm very excited to discuss and i'm going to explode shall i go first with my single bobs okay so i have three three points of what i think is going to happen in sunbring one the sea god is important obviously there is a very sea god looking person on the front cover the other thing is that the first one was very hero's journey going on a quest all of that kind of fun stuff but i think the next one is just going to be more politics heavy like yeah. I know like the rebels were really really important like in terms of Anara's like mum and what her mum was doing her mum's study always smelled of lemons and we learn later on that that's how the resistance are coding their messages that's what I meant and then the third one which is my theory with Anara's powers because we don't know who her dad is yeah I just re-listened to our episode and our previous speculation was I was team Yusuf god of safe havens mm. You guys were bringing up the God of War, possibly, yes. Mr. Andlers. But, yeah. Okay, so I forgot that. <laughs> because in my mind, I was like, <laughs> Sunbringer. She sees colours, like, of people's emotions and colours. And then, like, when light gets refracted, <laughs> the colours, like, um, you can see different colours. And I was like, she's the Sunbringer. That was my theory. Because God Killer is about a singular person. So I think Sunbringer That's is going to be about a singular person. So, yeah, politics. Sea God's going to be important, and Inara could possibly be the Sunbringer. Those are my theories. I'm going to slide in with um, I with my reread of the book and say that um, at the end, in the final fight, Aaron is called the Sunbringer. And I take it back. Someone else. I can't remember who. <laughs> One of the gods calls him the Sunbringer. Herself? Maybe. I have a slight spoiler, I feel like, if I'm allowed to slide it in. It's I not don't really mind. a spoiler. I don't mind. Um, the first chapter point of view is Aaron. Mm. <gasps> okay. Yeah, because yeah, I was just flicking at random and then it showed up and I was like, oh no. After his heel turn. <sighs> Hell yes. yes. So oh I think God. this is going to be a fairly Elo and Aaron centric book. That makes so much sense. If God Killer is about kissing, Sunbringer is by proxy about Elagast, and then the third one is about Inara. I could see like a redemption of Aaron and then him being like, no, I'm not the Sunbringer. You've always been my son or something. Ooh, so, like, you know, Ooh I can see dies. that, yes. <laughs> but interestingly, in the book, rereading it, I realised, I think, this is my theory, is the whole like lights that she sees, like all the emotions she, that Inara sees, mm-hmm. I don't think they've got anything to do with Skedisef. And I think that that is her so power. Either. Yes, I do. Yeah, I, I think that's a facet of her being a demigod. I think so. Which we also... We think she's a demigod. We should put yes. that out there. I like that theory about the Aaron redemption arc. We were, we were also discussing very heavily how in control we thought Aaron was of his own... Faculties. Nothing. He has no control. I think he's a little bit evil. I think he's a little bit in control because he did his whole, like, I'm going to be the god, and, like, he named the rivers after himself and stuff. But then again, I do think that there is possibility for a redemption arc mm-hmm. if he's being slightly controlled, because we did have that little, like, he might not be aware of what's happening from Elagos' point of view in the, like, Demi-Mort scene yeah. in book This one. is one of those few redemption arcs where I'm like, I'd be okay if it ends in death, because I feel like it could go, be, like, blaze of glory kind of vibes. I was going to say the exact same thing. I also have a thing where I believe make villains and keep villains and i don't mind maybe him when he like gets to the end and he's like i've made a really really bad decision Mm. but then like not having enough to redeem himself and that's what i think maybe might happen he might do dying regretful rather than redeemed yes 
I was saying that I thought that Kissin was going to kill him in in our previous discussion. I think that could still happen. I think I still want Elagast to kill him. Ooh. I think Inara with the steel chair. <laughs> oh, okay. Or God of Safe Havens with the steel chair. God of War with the steel chair. Isn't he dead? Well, he's dead, but they do make it clear that, like, just because gods are dead doesn't mean they can't come back. They just won't remember um, their previous okay. iteration. Oh, yes. But yes, they can yes. come back. Well, prediction. I think Kissin came back wrong. Kissin's not going to be the same. Mm. She, she's going to be, like, Oce- oceanic or something. Maybe she's going to have powers. I don't know. We're assuming we're thinking that a citizen is the one on the front. I do like that he's yeah, missing so. an arm and she's Ooh. missing a leg. So we've got some good parallels there going on. Nice. The fact that there's a village burning in the background, um, I think there's going to be a lot of destruction, which is not much of a wild prediction, but... <laughs> You know, I'm going to throw that in there. Um, I, d- I don't really have any wild predictions. I'm trying to think about my wild predictions because I was thinking about this earlier. I was thinking we're either going to get... I can't tell whether we're going to get... I think we're going to get, obviously, at the end, we had a big reveal that obviously um, Inara's... Obviously, like, well, we're. Pre- I think it's very obvious that she's deemed as a demigod and, like, her, her dad's a god of some kind. But I don't know whether we're going to get further power reveals. I don't know whether we're going to get... my. Th- we're either going to get further power reveals of, like, who she is and what she can do, or we're going to get a dad reveal at the end, or we're going to get a who Skeddy is reveal. Those are, like, my three things. I'm going to say my world prediction, because there is a bird on the cover. I think Inara is going to learn how to shapeshift. Ooh! Ooh. That's my, ho- that's okay. my spicy take. Elagas is going to make a new type of bread. <laughs> Very like important. This. Thank you. <laughs> Elagos starts um, cooking instead of <laughs> baking. <laughs> no, okay. I think you know we were so we were so on the Elagos to Aaron train in our last episode, and we were like they're in love. It's just so homoerotic, definitely. And we were saying that maybe we thought that Elagos had an unrequited love with Aaron until he was like, no, I didn't. I think Aaron was in love with Elagos, mm. and I think that's going to get revealed. Yeah. Like, yeah. I I think that we were picking up on the vibes, but just in like a slightly slightly to the left kind mm, of way yeah you know he has to destroy his heart to become a god mm. that man is definitely dying though at the end of the trilogy i also have to say just quickly before we go yeah, having yeah, re-listened yeah. to the whole book i was so mean in the episode giving it a 4.5 <laughs> because my brain was in full like dissertation mode and i was like so like just like i not did in a good think mood. that <laughs> what was wrong with me back then? Hannah Kader, this is my apology to you right now. I'm so sorry. I was so mean. Morgan, this is Morgan's apology blame video. My, <laughs> blame my university. Blame my degree. Does anyone have anything else to specifically some regular predictions? Or are we good? I'm good. I can't think of anything else. What happens? Sorry, sorry. What happens if she is the daughter of a sea god instead? <gasps> anyway, that's it. That was what I was going to say. Who, Anara? Yeah, I just thought, why not? Imagine if it was O-Citizen. I don't think it's O-Citizen, but imagine if it was O-Citizen, because Kissin's dad also dated O-Citizen, so then Anara and Kissin would kind of be like siblings. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that's all. That is so funny. And mic drop. Scene. We all made some correct predictions. I actually listened to that and then forgot every single correct prediction I made. So you're going to have to remind me what I said. You said the sea god was going to be very prominent and important. That's true. This is true. I mean, that was not hard to realise. <laughs> <laughs> the man's on the front cover. I was correct about the politics, though. Politics heavy. We were all wrong about Aaron dying in general. He still got time. He kind of died. He kind of died. Yeah. He got stabbed. He was made of sticks. <laughs> His sticks... I can't remember at what point I realised maybe this man is not this man. Hmm. I didn't think he had like a doppelganger. It took me so long to realise until I got to the actual page where it spelled out and I was like, oh yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I got very suspicious when he wouldn't take off his helmet, but I didn't get the whole long distance rejection thing, which really like, he basically did that last time. So I should have got that, but I didn't. I only got it when they when Lesser and Kissen yes. like got into the tower and then I was like, ah, which Same. just to say... Hannah Kainer is so good at like giving other characters information and then working on the dramatic irony of the audience knowing things that the other characters mm. now don't know. And you're just sitting there going, when are they going to find out that it's not really him? When are they going to find out that Inara is a demigod because Canavan's a demigod because this, this and this? It's just like you're sitting there rocking back and forth in the bath like, please. Considering we very strongly knew that Inara was going to be a demigod, mm. bearing in mind we literally said that from the beginning, I don't know how it took me so long to realise that Canavan was also a demigod. Mm. I have a note that says, Canavan can also see colours. There is more to Skeddy and Anara's bond than we think. 
babes he was he was a demigod that was his mother it took me way too long to realize no i it took me way too long as well to be honest <laughs> so i'm right with you there though your prediction about yousef the god of safe haven i was right on yousef 10 out of 10 I missed the thing about Inara being a safe haven for other gods, and that's why Skelly doesn't need a shrine. That makes so much sense, and it's so beautiful. Cool. That I is love so it. it's so well done. I do need a whole like flashback montage chapter though in, in the next book of him and Inara's mum. Unless it is alive, can we talk about this for a second? Oh my god, I need to set the scene for you guys. I was in the bath last night. <laughs> I was just sitting there. It took me ages to read this book because, again, we did it at the same time as one of my uni deadlines, unfortunately. The moment I got to that page when it was revealed, I literally, like, squeaked. Like, this is the first time I've, like, made a... Like, I was hand over mouth. I was kicking my feet. I can do you one better. I was in the library. I was in the <laughs> library. I couldn't make any noise. I, like, I, like, made, like, a large, expansive gesture and people looked at me. I was just in the staff room. So I obviously didn't want all the managers to be hearing me going, ah! I did a dramatic close of my book and like a mm. deep breath. Hashtag no body, no death. Inara's mum being alive. Yeah. Blew my mind. That blew my mind more than like the demigod reveal. Because I mean, we yeah, kind of knew, knew. She, yeah. she was a demigod. <laughs> yeah. So it, depending on who it was, it was kind of just like a nice addition. For me, I was like, oh my God, mm. this is amazing. This is really cool. But it didn't hit as hard as finding out that Inara's mum was still alive. Because I think I already had like a little thing always in the back of my head in fantasy books, no body, no death. I was reading the description and I had to cover my hand over the bottom of the page because I was like, I know what this is going to be. Like, I know exactly what this is going to reveal, but I I know I will flick down to the bottom of the page and see. So I covered my hand over it. And one of my colleagues was like, are you all right? And I was like, don't talk to me. (laughs) A big thing's about to happen. I need to see it for myself. That was the first punch, and then the second punch is Kissen immediately simping for her. Yes, which it was is so, so funny. funny. My little Swan Queen heart from back when I was obsessed with Once Upon a Time happens to the best of us. Fully on board. I'm like, yes, these two who have both parented this child at a different time are going to end up as co-parents, but they're actually going to date this time. Mm. Oh, I didn't even think of that. As well, of course, my um, poly shipping heart will be like, yeah, and Elagast is there too. Because Kissen has two hands. hands. My focus more was on the fact that Kissen was so much closer to Inara and Mm. watching Inara and Kissen interact felt more quote unquote motherly. My initial thought was just like, oh, this might ruffle a few feathers considering, you know, there was this whole like, you don't know Mm. who my daughter, like you're lying, da, 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 da. And then it's like, no, 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 this woman is basically her mother. Like the proof is in the pudding. It's right there in front of you, Lesser. Yeah, Kissin's attraction to Lesser aside, which, you know, very valid of her. I think it's going to be a matter of Inara making a choice at some point, because there is a lot of friction there. And I love it. I love the mess. I love the fact that Inara didn't even really realise until she had the option of both of them, that she had grown apart from her mother. Mm-hmm. Also, just God, the agony of Elo and Inara thinking that Kissin was dead and grieving for her, and then just coming back to Kissin, who's just like angrily climbing a mountain. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. It was funny. <laughs> Elo and Inara are personally both using Kizan's death to begin their villain eras, and then Kizan's just out here, like, becoming one with the gods. Yeah. Like. <laughs> but I also felt the same way in that kind of, like, juxtaposition when you would get, like, Inara's chapters, and she would be like, everybody hates me, they'd be better off without me, and then you cut to literally every single person's point of view, and they were like, I've just got to do what's right for Inara. I've got to look after her, I've got to protect her. And I wanted to, like, go, Inara, babe, you're fine. You're She's fine. entering her like teenage angst era. Yeah, that's that's what it is. She already chopped her hair off, so it's chopped happening. her hair off. She killed a man. What more do you need? The hair. The hair made me cry. I, I did. I cried. I it was close. I was very close, and we, we know what I'm like with crying. I just don't. Hannah Kainer is so good at like just mentioning something just enough times that it hits with emotional weight later on. Like with Kelt and with the hair, they both existed in book one and you knew that Inara cared about her hair because it was like her mother's and you knew that Kelt was this whole thing that like he hadn't had a shrine in a long time until Inara came along. And then they come back in in book yeah. two and you're like just bodied by the emotions. The hair cutting scene is always like very symbolic for changing who you are or some kind of transformation. Mulan. You know, that, that iconic scene in Mulan. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I always view 
um, haircuts, especially like very dramatic haircuts from like really long hair to shorter hair is always a sense of transformation. And it's kind of like Anara. She comes to terms a little bit more with who she is. She learns a lot and it's emphasized with a good haircut. I am envisioning a tangled Rapunzel-esque haircut of her just rocking a lovely little short brunette bob if you will. I want to see it animated. It was written so beautifully. The instant reaction from the gods, I was just like, oh my God. I was picturing like intense music in my head Mm. as this was happening. I was like, it felt very cinematic. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking that as well, actually. I was like, if Hannah Kena ever wants to go into screenwriting, she's got the visuals down. She's got Mm -hmm. the drama down. The dialogue in this, I I maybe I just didn't mention it in the last episode, but she's so good. She's so funny. There's so much good banter and so much good intense exchanges i wish i'd highlighted everything in this book i probably would have highlighted something from every single page i felt that the writing was so it felt elevated compared to the first book in terms of just like her word choices the choices with the sentence structure and everything i was just like this is so beautiful and i just want to like frame it i highlighted one thing because i decided i wasn't going to and then i highlighted one thing i was like okay i'm gonna highlight and then i didn't highlight a single other thing so well, what too was busy. the one thing you highlighted it, i've shown india this and she was like that's such a rogue thing to highlight it was literally just me going oh my god the found family and it's page 20 aaron would pay for making anara cry that's so good only thing i highlighted no i get it speaking of the beginning the first scene with Aaron, where we get the line, mm. he was dying it again and Ello wasn't here to hold him. Mm. Oh my God. No, that man, sorry. I say this every time. You cross my favorite characters. I, I don't care. No, I love him. He's the worst. But like, I was having, I oh my him. God, I was living for the Aaron content. I was so happy, especially because I thought we were going to get like a prologue from his point of view and then never see him again. And then we get him again and we get into his head. And he's so, what is he thinking? I love him. I love him. Okay, we've had it confirmed, okay? Because Aaron specifically said, you never loved me the way I loved you. He said that it, he said is... it, canon. Gay, gay allegations are not That's being gay. beaten after this one. <laughs> you were so like, right. We said, it, we said it in our mind. We've seen the signs. This is, I'm like going to throw a book three prediction in right now. We love it. it. I am early. so excited for the, uh, like, the threat degradation from Aaron. Mm, you know yes, when like the it. villain of us of like a previous season ends up being forced to work with the heroes and until they're basically just like yeah i'm evil and terrible you guys should be scared of me and everyone's like okay sure <laughs> there are bigger things you're not scary you're like a cat it's the spike treatment from buffy and i i'm so excited for them to be forced to work together inara like straight up nearly killed him yeah at the end of the book. Both of you were closer than with Kissin killing him, because Kissin was team Let's Leave Him Alive, which was insane as well. I loved how we got <laughs> to that point of view where Kissin was like, I'm talking to the gods, I'm talking about Aaron, I think that they should stay alive, and the other two were like, murder. You know what, sometimes murder is necessary, definitely in book three, because like, Inara literally, she's like, one wrong move, babe, and it's over for you. And I respect that, because I support women's wrongs. I feel like he's going to live now. I think he's going to oh, live. I, don't, I still don't think it. I still don't. The like last bit we got with him, he was basically acting like an angry cat. Like he was not threatening. He was just bedraggled and slightly pathetic. And he was like, no, Ello, it's going to be fine because now you don't have to die because I figured it out. We can all be friends again. It's fine. I thought you had to die, but you can forgive me now. And him going through an arc, whoops, I can't ever be forgiven, but I can work at making amends. Hannah Kane is going to have to put a lot of work into making me like that man. I see her truth. I see her vision. I'm following it to the end. Obviously, the whole point is they need him alive because he has to be a representative of something. Yeah. And I just want the man to die. I'm sorry. Maybe what they'll do is they'll have him die and they'll play it as a whole. Like, he sacrificed himself for the country. I hope they don't, to be honest. Now I I don't. Like, I take back what I said in the blind about uh, being happy that he would, like, he's okay to, like, die saving everyone and then redeem himself. Because now he's, like, been slightly redeemed too early. Like, Mm. take, for example, Percy Jackson. It's fine that Luke has a redemption moment because it happens only in that moment and it's built up really well. This, no. This man is not allowed to get out of his redemption arc by dying. This man has to work for it. That's true. Oh, I just want him dead. (laughs) Sorry. So I feel like, kind of, like, consistently she makes the choice that is the most interesting. Like, Lesser being uh, alive, you could argue, is, like, a little bit deus ex machina-y. Like, oh, she wasn't in the Mm. house or she knew it was going to happen or whatever. Like, how did this happen? Why is it that she's alive? And how has she run into Kissin here? But it is like narratively the most interesting dynamic that we can yeah. have. 
And I feel like Aaron having to awkwardly work with the heroes is also now should be the most interesting dynamic. So I don't think we can kill him. I just want him to receive some punishment. Maybe I'm just a bit of a grudge holder, but I'm like, I don't, I, I don't know, the working for it thing and then him getting redeemed at the end, Prince Zuko style, doesn't work for me. I don't think he's going to get fully, because they're not going to forgive him. No, mm. and I don't want them to. Not forgiven, but working towards redemption. I just want it to end with maybe like, not necessarily in exile, but like maybe he just mm. is the king and all of that, but him and Ello are done. I don't think he's going to repair that relationship. I don't. No, no, it's just too, like, literally, it's too big of a thing. He literally was going to kill the love of his life. A power. I think Aaron will end up, like, bonding with a bunch of other characters and they'll, like, mm. bond over their love of Elo. And then Aaron will be like, oh, yeah, it's going to be okay now. And Elo will be like, fuck off. Yeah, I hope so. I loved how Hero's Journey questy the first mm. book was and I knew we were going to lose that a little bit. But I did like the fact that it was the fact that they're all stuck in this one city. Obviously, you've got Kissen's journey to get home. But then for Inara and Ello, it's basically like, oh, we can't leave the city. We're stuck here trying to scramble around to like stop this attack on the city. And I felt like, oh, thank God, it's not just like walking around and going to a bunch of different places and chatting and an occasional fight. Like it felt like it had something a bit more cohesive. And like all the scenes with the gods and when they did go on the attack and the scene with Canavan and the shadows. One thing I will say again with Hannah Kana is visually everything felt mm. so strong. Like I felt such a like a visceral reaction seeing Canavan come out with all the cuts that he had done on his body to bring more power out of him. Like I was literally like, oh wow, this is like visually so well written. And that's one thing about Hannah Kana's writing that I really enjoyed. I enjoyed God Killer and Sunbringer the same. I don't think I could choose which one was my favorite because I enjoyed both of them. Plot wise, maybe God Killer just because I love a good, I love a good quest. But I felt one of the things that definitely had improved from the first one to the second one was I just felt her writing had just, it was just so beautiful and full of such great imagery that was in the first book, but was like elevated. I will say one thing, but I did get a bit confused with the outside of the country politics. And I think this is me. I think I need everything literally laid out in front of me and you need to hold my hand a little bit with it. But I kept getting a bit confused about all the stuff going on like outside of what was going on in this specific country with all the other places I was like wait what does this mean who's this where are they coming from what pack that was the one thing where I was like I'm a bit confused and I know this is going to be important for the next book I'm assuming that the official version will have a map that includes not only Midran but also Talithia which one would be easier because I think I want to say that the first book only had Midran on the map mm. whereas obviously the arc of Sunbringer has no maps which is slightly stressful for those of us who are geographically challenged like me I tend to not look at maps anyway to be honest so I probably would have never have looked back at that map and still been like I'm so confused I only do sometimes I think the only other book where I've had to keep checking the map was Priory of the Orange Tree and that's because um. they keep going in so many different directions and I'm like I don't know where we are yeah, I, f- I felt okay with the politics of other countries, but I was occasionally when there were like a lot of different people in a scene. Like I kind of felt okay with like the king's people, but then w- I think it was because we were so close to the end when we were introducing all of Lessa's retinue and her supporters. I was like, I can't keep track of these people. There's way too much going on. And I think it was because I was so focused on the end. Like we were at that like highest octane action. Mm cutting between it and then it's like here's these people and one of them is a regent because the other one is going to take power when he comes of age i'm like i don't care right now everything's on fire i just (laughs) want to know who lives and who dies yeah (laughs) i've got two favorite scenes Mm -hmm. one is when kissen realizes that his seth's going to be having her comeback era earlier than planned and it's all the chanting like big statue shrine thing that they've dedicated to her and that like sense of just like Kissen's intense fear of like this is a lot bigger than I thought this is going to affect us in a greater scale than I think anybody realizes and I thought that was written so well with such great urgency and the other scene the patron state of the city that they're in that scene where she finally like comes out because it's like it's my day that whole scene of her walking through beautiful Mm. Oh my God, now I can think of another one. When Naya and a bunch of other people are all like arms linked around, I believe it's the archives and they're doing like their peaceful protest. 
It was so beautiful, but I was also scared. I was very scared. I feel like this is going to be a compliment that sounds like an insult. The Kane is almost too good at writing war in that I feel like a lot of fantasy, it's a complaint that I've held on this show before. I'm not necessarily about a book that we've talked about here, but just about like fantasy as a genre mm. kind of glorifies war sometimes. And it's like, isn't this cool and fun? And I'm like, this was horrific. I was not having a good time. It was almost a bit too much, despite all of the like high fantasy elements of it. It still felt very grounded in genuine violence quite a lot of the time especially when like it's the hero they're kind of cutting through people and it's like wow i'm so cool but here it's like no this is awful it's terrifying these are people whose entire lives are being destroyed and it's all for something that nobody signed up for nobody's really sure they even believe in and it's just people bulldozing their way through very unfortunately of the times that we're experiencing right now and it's just absolutely petrifying and i was yeah very uncomfortable and I think specifically it's that scene with Naya and all the people who are linking their arm they're just complete innocent people that just want to protect their city yeah and we get to see also the characters that we do love committing atrocities and it's kind of framed like that like Ella is just chopping people's heads off chopping people's fingers off thankfully it's like it's not framed as well as this is the hero who's you know doing the right thing and these people got in the way it's like no he's going against kind of everything he stood for like all of the characters go against their strong beliefs at the beginning kissing was never going to kill a person like it was always i'm only killing gods and then she kills that young guy he's then working with gods and making deals with gods and it just shows how war can change people down to the core of who you are not just like oh i'm disagreeing with a couple of things like no the core of who you are and everything you stand for will change i like especially about ello's arc in this book though is it's made clear that like the only reason you as a reader think that he's not like that is because you Mm. met him when he was in his peaceful Mm -hmm. baker era and it's made clear that he was like this before he was committing terrible atrocities beforehand and like this is where he sort of slips back into with such ease and no one's there to stop him and he doesn't really fall down on the side of what i was doing was bad by the end of this book so especially with anara also like quickly going down that rabbit hole so i'm interested to see how kizan reacts those two are linking arms. Yeah. They're linking arms and they're skipping down the road because they're both like, we made necessary choices. It's like, besties, you are doing atrocities and I'm worried you're going to go across, you're going to tip over the deep end and you're going to regret things. Because, I mean, the amount of PTSD and like deep, deep regrets that Elagas is going through in book one, I know he's going to have one of those realizations where he's like, It was really easy for me to get back into that mindset and to do those things that I did that I regretted so much from the from the first war. Mm. But there was still baking, which I was very happy. There was still baking, and he did bake something new. So you were right. Hey! hey. (laughs) (laughs) Mm. I just need to know what happened between the God of Safe Haven and Lesser. Like, I just need that. I need that chapter. This is interesting Mm. because I feel like we all went into it thinking they had sex and they have a child. Yeah. Whereas everyone's like, that's not how that works. How was Inara made? So I feel like maybe we just like skipped over Mm. something here. Is it like Athena in the Percy Jackson show where Mm. she just has a mind child? Like, I I need to know how how this union came about. Mm. Because if Lesser had a motivation for having a child, then what was it? Mm. Well, when uh, Lethen is talking about Canavan, she's like, I made him, I bore him, but I could not protect him always. I bore him. That's interesting. Uh, okay. Okay. She carried him around like the Lion King for nine months and then just <laughs> threw him off the cliff. So you're assuming it was like, it could have been like one second. <laughs> I don't know. I also thought it was quite interesting was obviously the fact that Skeddy had been with Yusef all the time yeah and then it's just like i don't have yousef i do have a mini yousef <laughs> i really love two things about that a the fact that we find out that lesser didn't actually know that skeddy seth's been hanging around, hanging around the whole time yeah um, which is quite fun b what it says about the fact that the god of safe havens was hanging out with the god of white lies mm. because nothing is truly safe yeah yeah that's good I really liked getting a little bit of more understanding of who Skedaseth is, mm. the amount of power he feels when he gets given like the button, because mm. you kind of see him a little bit as like, he is his own character, but I've always been like, oh, it's Anara and Skedaseth and here, oh, like, no, this is a god we're talking about, like, and getting those little gifts and those little trinkets, and he was able to do so much more. 
and move further away from Inara. And I was just like, oh, I can't wait to see him at like full, full, full capacity. And I know it's going to happen. Because also his lies changed a little bit as well. I'm yeah. adamant that that happened. He's going to be unstoppable when like he gets more followers and things like that. And I'm intrigued to see what that means because obviously the whole point about white lies is oh they're harmless they're just little white lies but the lies were changing yeah, he was telling far more dramatic lies in terms of like oh yeah she's a scholar and she works here and you've totally seen her before and then also things that weren't lies like when the king was marching through the city and he was saying to the rest of the guard so he's using you and it's like well that's just objectively true yeah so <laughs> what's going on I don't know whether he might just become like the god of just like lies in general. And I think that is going to be, if that like is the case, that's going to make him pretty powerful. Ooh. God of emotions. Oh, good shout. I was going to say god of narratives or storytelling or something. Like he can bend the story and frame. Oh, Ooh, you know, I love a good bit of meta. Yes. I like that. The god of improv. Sorry. <laughs> the god of improv. <laughs> The god of yes and. <laughs> the twin gods, yes and, and no but. <laughs> Can I talk about language in this book? Please there are yes. such like very specific language things that I really loved. I'm not even talking about like the con like I'm talking about like actual like writing choices. Mm -hmm. One of them is the fact that when Inara uses the word sunbringer, she says the sunbringer and uses it as a title. Whereas when Elagast uses it, he uses it as a name and just says Sunbringer without the the because he's trying to replace Aaron in his head and like dehumanize him. I really liked that difference. Mm. That was really, really, that just, oh, that got me. Very, very good. One, like there's two other like specific lines I want to call out. And one is when these aren't as like intellectual, these are just, I liked them. Um, when Inara talks about Elagast, she calls him her knight, which is. We love the found family possessive. That was that that got me. I nearly cried at that just by itself. <sighs> Good soup. And <laughs> the other one was the way Aaron was talking in the final scene when he sees Elagast and Kizan reunite and he's like, What's going on here? And I'm like, Yeah. Jealous boyfriend. Jealous boyfriend alert. <laughs> I I love a good jealous boyfriend, so I'll accept that. I'll read about five hundred pages of that. Um as long as that man <laughs> dies at the end. <laughs> I want him to just witness the found family and be completely blocked out of it the entire time and have to realise yeah. what he lost. I think that's what's happening. And same with Lessa, realising that obviously she's dedicated so much. I mean, not, not to make the poor woman feel bad, she's trying to save a country. <laughs> but she had to make a decision of, it, like, is she going to be the leader of a rebellion or is she going to be a mum? And she clearly made the choice that for the country. And I think we're going to see a lot of scenes in the way that Inara and Kissin are, that she's going to be like, I've had to sacrifice so much to lead this rebellion and she gets like an absolute visual of that because Kissin and Inara in that scene near to the end where Kissin's like oh my god are you okay yeah the way that Inara chooses Kissin over Lesse in that scene when Lesse's like don't do it do this do this and Inara's like that's my mother actually don't know who you are oh I love it I oh I love it it's so good And remind me, Kissin's family, the one that is the archivist. Tello. I love her. And also her and her wife together, when they ran to each other's arms and they realised they were safe and all they could think about oh, was gosh. each other during time. Just, I had to put the book down. I love them so, so much. It was just, uh, like, love is, love is not dead, guys. Love is not dead. God, I hope they're okay. I'm sure they're okay. They won't just die off page. You see them, like, disagreeing with each other, but still, like working through it as adults and like trying to like bridge the gap but also understanding that they don't have to agree on everything 100 percent to still be in love i was gonna say we love to see healthy communication but they're not communicating that's the issue but they fix it so it's fine they fixed it you know you can't always be perfect if you're having communication problems with your spouse get caught up in a riot and then you'll be they'll be so grateful <laughs> that you're okay <laughs> speaking of cousin's family though to go back to her uh birth family I love how we see how growing up with a citizen basically next door yeah. shaped her. Because we don't really see it in the first book because obviously they're not by the sea. But in the second book, you see sort of all these little bits of her knowing exactly how to live in this area and how to do all these things because of her childhood, which she's tried to force down. 
And also her just getting adopted by a bunch of different gods. Like she's a little cat that has just been wandering around and they're like, you're mine now. And she's like, I don't like gods. And they're like, I like you though. I love that when that happens. We we were a big fan of Arn from the first book. And when she got to reappear, I was happy. I was like, and then she had like a different vibe because she was kind of, kind of at the source of her power. And I was like, this is incredible. And the fact that Kissa was like, I forgot how beautiful this woman is. I, I'm getting overwhelmed. Don't look. <laughs> it's so funny every time. It's so good. I haven't been so excited for a sequel in such a long time. I feel like I haven't got into a series. I'm going to die of impatience. Literally, I was at work today. I finished this at like one in the morning and I've been reading it pretty much exclusively for the last week. And then when I was at work today, when I had my lunch break, I thought, ooh, I can find out what happens next. And then I was like, no, you finished the book. This is it now. You have to wait a year. And I thought it multiple times throughout the day. I thought on my commute home, I was like, oh, I can get it. And then I was like, no, it's done. That's it. And I feel like I haven't thought of that in ages where I'm just like, I'm just ready to keep going immediately. Mm -hmm. Like, where, where's the rest of it? Where's, where, where's the next part? Yeah. Usually I like read the first book in a series like four years after it came out, even though I bought it the day it came out. And then <laughs> I, I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to start the second book. And then four years later, I'll be like, oh, I need to reread the first book and then I can read the second one. And then I just never do. I am intrigued as well for the next book because obviously you've had god killer some bring i'm like which which word are we using for the next book it's going to be god kind i'm calling it now Ooh. because it's going to be anara's okay. book they yes. brought in that word and it's a very sort of like titular okay. word and i feel like they did also say god's blood didn't they oh yeah i feel like god kind fits better though but i do think they might go god's blood because god kind is too similar to god killer mm, this is true or they just do some like a completely different thing, like Haven Maker. Baker. Haven Maker. <laughs> so I just went straight to the baking again. Bun Baker. <laughs> I do think, it, yeah, I'm intrigued. It's definitely going to be Inara's book next. I'm intrigued to see at the end of the series what happens with the gods, whether they're fully accepted. Are they going from a complete ban to like completely lifting it? Or what? Because obviously people still interact with the gods and they still have dedications to the gods and shrines and everything. But obviously there's that very strict ban. Because obviously Aaron is going for, I am your god, besties. You don't need anyone else but me. Yeah, especially if we're trying to turn Aaron into a figurehead, then we can't immediately undermine his entire platform, which is tear down all of the shrines and stamp out all of the gods. So they're in a really awkward mm -hmm. position. Because if they do, then that gets out to their enemies and everyone goes, well, hang on, people are like whispering in Aaron's ear. He's not presenting like a united front or like a steady image not that he was before mm. to be fair running around <laughs> abandoning his own city with apparently not enough guard <laughs> to quell a rebellion but we all make bad decisions and also being like we hate gods they're delusional they're power hungry they're awful i'm definitely not talking about myself this not entire me, time because i'm a god but i'm fine <laughs> i'm built different i didn't look in the mirror <laughs> i could see them pulling a magnus archives and spoilers for the Magnus Archives listeners, but what if we just yeet the gods entirely? Ooh. I don't think we're doing that because I think the problem mm. is that like gods don't run on their own magic, they run on human belief. So as long as there's humans around, they're just going to make more of them. Well, again, this is my point with the Magnus Archives is I don't think that they actually fix anything at the end and I think that the entities will regrow over time. I was kind of thinking Inara gets the throne and I don't really know like how or why. Ooh. I support I support women's wrongs. Aaron is kind of becoming a god through his connection to God. Anara kind of represents that so much more than Aaron. Yeah. Than what like Aaron's trying to portray is what Inara actually is. So it'd be quite interesting if they go, This dude is a lie, but she's the real deal. But I don't think it would be Inara. I think it would be lesser. Because they'd be like, We can't give the throne to a child. We'll give it to her mum and then she can Yeah. As Queen Regent or whatever it is. Yeah, Lesser is Regent and Inara technically on the throne. Yeah, because people were starting to believe in, believe in Inara towards the end there. So, mm. also, I don't know when to bring this up, but I just want to say, Kenna continues to absolutely knock it out of the park with disability representation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. good. I loved, with Tella, all of the ways that there was, like, insidious ableism in her place of work. Mm. that was, like, subtle that she was trying to hide. It was, just, it, there was just so much good stuff going on. We found out that Bea is autistic, or, like, at least he was heavily implied to yes. be. Yes. Yes, I, I literally that. wrote that down in my book. I was like, oh my goodness. Also, get kissing a new prosthetic. Jesus, she went through this whole book. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Broken prosthetic. I was so, I was like feeling the pain on her yeah. behalf the entire time. I was like, please, bestie, sit down. Please stop climbing mountains. 
I, I she's like you. dehydrated limbs are just struggling and she's like I, I gotta do it and even that hermit is like babe you need to chill for five minutes i don't think you can last another day she's yeah. like i got it i promise <laughs> i don't have a neat transition for this either i did want to say we've been talking a lot about the main characters because we love them and we miss them but i don't want to put words in anyone's mouth but i feel like this is true mm-hmm. i agree but i feel like every side character is so good because of Kana's like really empathetic approach to writing you can really feel that everyone is their own main character like i was noticing a lot when kissin was being held with the king's guards and there was one of them like faking being passed out so that he could like try a runner for it later and then she caught that other guy who was like terrified but was like i'd rather die than tell the king's secret and i was like it's just in the way that she writes even like npcs in inverted commas like characters who don't have a name you still get the sense that they have this entire life and story going on and it's just so good and when we had the lord's son murder his father i i did see that coming. i saw that coming a mile away i didn't I, I was like, why are they drawing attention to the fact that this guy is such a weirdo about Aaron? He's going to kill his dad. Mm. Like, why did you let him leave? He was so obviously going to run to Aaron Honestly. and tell him everything. Shout out to the- that poor general who just was like, don't worry, guys, I've got this. And then was like attached to the back of a horse naked. Oh. And then nobody helped the poor dude. <laughs> yeah, and then he him. just was going across the desert naked. I'm going to be honest. He kind of got what he deserved at that point. <laughs> I was like, this guy's balls out. <laughs> what do we do? Also, the banter that takes place when he arrives with the whole, like, have you checked if the sun shines out of his... <laughs> and then he's like, go back to your baking. And he's like, at least the light from the oven smells better. <laughs> that is so funny. An icon, truly. I say, my favourite character. My guy. Is everyone's favourite character the same? Has it changed? It was my favourite character last time, I don't remember. Mine still is Elagast. I think you also said Elagast, Morgan. You did. I feel like yours is going to be like Aaron or something. I don't (laughs) know what it is. I feel like it is. I think my favourite character is now Aaron. I just love a good bedraggled cat villain who is forced to not be the villain anymore, but likes to think they are. And I am so ready for it. And he is very interestingly bonkers. I love to see it. But I loved everybody in this. But I think Aaron stole my heart slightly. Because he doesn't have one. He needs one, you know. I'll give it to him. Um, <laughs> you know, for free. He doesn't deserve it, Morgan. You know. You know. And he doesn't want it because it's not his boyfriend, Baker Knight's heart. You know, it's okay. I will steal Ello's heart for him. And then, and then give it to another him. another civil war. Whoops. I think Aaron deserves to suffer and I want to see it. And so he's my favourite. Yeah. As do I. Elegas is still my fave. I just... That's so valid. I like him. I just... I'm a loyal gal. What can I say? I guarantee that man will be my favourite in the next book as well. I'm just a big fan of him. I do request more bread baking, though. I know that's not really the time, but I do request it. We did still get some. We did still get some. We got some, but not enough. No. <laughs> but obviously the times weren't really calling for for some baking time no. so Soren, who is yours still aaron or... yes of course yeah come on he got more unhinged in this book <laughs> and we got more in- insights into his little silly little dynamic with ello where it's like oh we used to steal from the kitchens stop leave me alone this is like what i'm here for it's the homosexual fanatic. it's the childhood friends to almost lovers dynamic which is just so exactly such good soup it's that quote that makes the rounds on tumblr all the time that was like the worst word in the world is almost he was almost the one i'm still calling for the man's death i'll take an exile i'd be down for him to die if it was narratively satisfying yeah like to be clear, I don't want Aaron and Ello to get together. Oh, no. <laughs> at all. In any world. Not even, like, for the messiness of it. I don't think it would be, yeah, I don't think it would be coherent. Do you still want Kissin and Elagast to get together, though? Because, obviously, there wasn't really much of that in this book. I kind of do. Kissin has two hands. One for Elagast and one for Lessa. I did like the Nye and Elagast vibes, though. I did like that as well. I really liked it. You know, Elagast also has two hands. After a war, there is enough time for love. And you know what? I feel like Kristen would be into Naya. I think she would. Steadfast woman? Definitely. That would be a fun truffle. Now, I would be very unsatisfied if it doesn't end this way. <laughs> <laughs> Ello is obviously like more unhinged than he appears. But like in book one, it seemed like he was the less unhinged one out of Kristen and Ello. Whereas here, he was very much <laughs> being unhinged. And I was like bringing him down. He just down. needed an excuse. Yeah. <laughs> 
also quick shout out to like the awkward friendship that grew between Canavan and Elagast that then got completely destroyed. What was going on there? You tried to kill me. Elagast has a type. <laughs> <laughs> As we're in the appreciating Elo zone, but I will say, the, we'll have your head for this. My head is not on offer. Exchange. <laughs> Elo's come back. He's just so good. He was on it. I would go to his stand up set. I'm just saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> the priest up the mountain, when Kizan's like, What do you do when it snows? And the priest's like, I stand further back. <laughs> that was I love that line. <laughs> Hannah Kena, have you considered writing for comedy? I think you should. <laughs> yeah. Gives you a break from all the war and suffering. You know, if Skediseth becomes the god of improv, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, we've been going an hour and 15. I feel like I have to ask people for final thoughts. India, you are our guest, so I feel like you should go first. My final thought would be, I obviously really loved God Killer, and I did really like thoroughly enjoy this book. And I rarely have it where I enjoy the sequel just as much as the first book. Mm. I don't think I could choose. Like, I know I said, oh, maybe god killer maybe more but i actually am rescinding that i don't actually think i can choose between god killer and sunbringer because they complement each other and they work together so well so much so that i don't think there is a specific book that i can choose that i enjoyed more i feel like i'm gonna feel that way across the series where like i just enjoyed the series as a whole and i can't actually pick which one i like because it was just so good and i was a big fan and i'm desperately gonna be waiting for the next book which won't come out until next year so i'll be waiting I really enjoyed this book. I loved it a lot. I think we need to stop picking schedules, which mean that I read it at the same time as I have a uni deadline because it makes me suffer deeply. (laughs) Because you need to give your whole brain to these books because it's such in-depth world building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I vibed with it. I think that Hannah Kena especially is very good at ending books. I think she's very Mm. good at that third act sequence and it really ties the whole book together. And... Yeah, I haven't been this excited for a book to come out regarding book three in a long time. I absolutely echo those sentiments. I'm obsessed. I'm already thinking about book three, so I'm going to be suffering. Yeah, I'm also kind of torn on, is this better? Sitting in the library, I was sitting with my friend who's been on the show before, Izzy, who I recently bought the first God Killer 4. And she was like, oh, it's so good. I'm enjoying it so much. Is the second one as good? You know, the second book syndrome, I think people do expect it to sort of dip a bit. And I was sitting there being like, it might be better. But also, I don't want to say that it is because the first one was also so good, which is a great problem to have. But I also kind of do feel like you were saying, India, that maybe the writing has just got even better. The beauty of the prose. I can picture the cloche and the oxidized copper and the roses and stuff so clearly. All of the fight scenes were beautiful. And maybe in terms of personal taste, I'm probably a bit more into the politics than the questing. So I had fun with that. Can we just fast forward to 2025, please? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do we have any recommendations in the meantime for everyone else who's out there suffering? I'm going to recommend Cuckoo Song by Francis Hardinge. If you like Aaron being made of twigs and Ooh. you're like, what if? the being made of twigs had an own like separate identity and thought that it was Aaron, but it turns out it wasn't Aaron, but it is the point of view character and is wandering around thinking it's Aaron, but then things start falling out of it. And it has to like eat memories that are close to Aaron in order to keep being Aaron and is technically the villain, but is also just trying to be a good Aaron. Then you should read Cuckoo Song. It's YA but it's also body horror and it's so good. It's so good. It might be my favorite of hers, maybe. Yeah. I reread it last year and was like, damn, this hits just as hard as it did when I was 13. Actually, you know what? I'm going to piggyback off of that and say Deep Light. <laughs> if you love cool world building, creepy eldritch gods, if you want to take them a bit less personably and a bit more, this is a force of the ocean that will kill me and not even notice me kind of thing. And if you love childhood friends to enemies dynamics and not even childhood friends to enemies but childhood friends to you're not quite human anymore and maybe our relationship was really never on an equal footing and in some way we did love each other but there's also just this growing rift between us and at the end of the day I think you're just going to crush me underfoot in your quest for godhood very specific dynamic (laughs) deep light's got it and also good disability rap lots of deaf characters okay this is a very 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 loose connection but 
I really want to recommend the Full Metal Alchemist manga series because it's very political. There is monster elements to it. Well, if you like good sibling dynamics, I don't know where there's a good sibling dynamic in this book, but if you love good sibling dynamics, and there is disability representation in Full Metal Alchemist mm. with Edward, who also has prosthetics. If you do like traumatized children. <laughs> Um, We're taking that out of context, India. <laughs> um, and if you like a good, very deep-rooted political story, mm. then I would recommend Full Metal Alchemist. Mm. It's very, very good. It's one of my all-time favorite manga series. It's not exactly like God Killer, but there is some crossover. And I do think if you're a fan of God Killer, I think you would actually quite like Full Metal Alchemist. Thank you for coming on the show again. It was lovely to have you. And we will see you back yeah. for Bread Baker. Bread Baker. <laughs> We'll be yet again bullying the both of you and sending texts into the group chat being like, hey guys, if you ever like really need someone last minute, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Hannah Kenya, if you're listening to this, you can send me the arc uh, like early this time so that I don't have to <laughs> yeah. make this for ages. Please, please. I think at this point, with a second episode, I think we can make it work. I will release the legs, cat, Hannah. I saw that you liked that tweet. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk about the horses. I love the horses. Yeah, Senator, bless him. Queen of my heart, legs. I hope legs is okay. We don't know that legs is okay. I hope legs is okay. Mm. Legs has been left in the city. He has, but he'll be okay. I believe in. It's him. fine. He's going to go find Tele and Yatho, and everything's going to be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be okay. But yes, if people want to find you, India. Where can they find you? It's India reads a lot, pretty much everywhere. On my blog, on my my TikTok, my Instagram. Follow me if you like. India's TikTok's great. I do try. The imposter syndrome gets me all day, every day. Thanks. And India is reading The Hunger Games. Remember last time when India was like, I might read The Hunger Games? I have read it. It's read. Ooh. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was very, very good. One side note, me and mine and Morgan's friend, I have beef with for one specific thing is that she is not a Peter fan. And... <sighs> was like, he did communicate very well. I was like, that man literally was paying for his life. I think we could let the lack of communication skills go. And he bakes bread, as we've discussed. You can be forgiven <laughs> for all sins. Bread, and, you, and you know, if that man bakes bread, they are my fave. And also, that man that man has a lot of charisma, and he knows how to make a storyline like work. You know? So <laughs> mm. he's a king of improv, you know, and I respect that. <laughs> he worships Skeddy every night. <laughs> he worships Skeddy. That is that is why he didn't need the he didn't need the sponsors from Haymitch because he had Skeddy on his side the entire time. <laughs> Next, we will be reading for sequel spring. We will be reading Bloodmarked by Tracy Dion, which is the sequel to Legendborn. Neither of us have read it, although I will admit that I did read the first like couple chapters when I was delirious from pain and a tattoo appointment because it was the only ebook I could get from the library on my phone. So I have read a little bit. But have you retained it? Not much happened as far as I can remember, to be honest. So, um, but also I was quite delirious. So, fittingly, India introduced me to Legendborn the first time because uh, we did it for our book group. So. I didn't know this. This is amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. It was my first five star read of last year. Some TikTok recommendations can be hit or miss. None of the recommendations on my account, but no, some TikTok recommendations can be a little bit hit or miss, but. Every single person that said Legendborn is amazing has never lied. That'll be out the 1st of April. Oh, April Fool's. <laughs> it will genuinely be out on the 1st of April. We are not lying. <laughs> <laughs> Until then, you're always welcome to the bookcase. Don't forget to scratch the cat on your way out. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Bookcase, a production of Planar Prod. On this episode, you heard India Reads A Lot, Morgan Greensmith and Soren Brywood discussing Sunbringer by Hannah Kaner. You can find out more about this book at hannahkaner.com and you can follow Kaner on Twitter at hfkaner. A huge thank you to India, the sunniest of guests, for joining us for this episode. You can find her at India Reads A Lot on most social media platforms, but mostly on TikTok. You can find The Hidden Bookcase on Twitter at Hidden Bookcase, and on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, and TikTok at Hidden Bookcase Podcast. Find out more about Planar Prod at planarprod.com. Know what we should read next, and want to chat to us about what you thought of this episode's read? You can reach us at thehiddenbookcase at gmail.com, send us a DM on social media, or come chat with your fellow bookworms in our growing Discord server. The link is in the show notes. Want to support The Hidden Bookcase? Support us on Patreon for bonus episodes, audio outtakes, playlists, and other extras, or consider leaving us a rating or a review, or telling a friend how to find us. Your whispers are the best way for bookworms to discover our show. On our next episode, which will be out on Monday, the 1st of April, really, we promise, we'll be discussing Bloodmarked by Tracy Dion. We hope to see you then, and in the meantime, you're always welcome through The Bookcase. <laughs>